The world is one big family. Time and distance have been annihilated. National isolation is a thing of the past. Woodbridge Ferris, in July 1914, opened the American Peace Centenary Conference on Mackinac Island. He, like fellow progressive Democrat Woodrow Wilson, strongly believed in working together with others. While the word collaboration does not appear in any of Mr. Ferris's writings, the practice of it was central in his daily activities. Collaboration can also be seen in one of the most important events in the history of Ferris, the Old Main Fire in 1950. It destroyed over half the campus and physically altered the way campus looked. At the conclusion of a February term, a custodian found a fire in the attic of Old Main. Because of the severity of the fire and the lack of water pressure due to freezing temperatures, they were unable to save either Old Main or the pharmacy annex. At the end of the night, only charred remnants remained. But this episode also showed the spirit of Ferris and their ability, like the Phoenix, to rise from the ashes. Following the fire, students moved out of the army barracks, which were being used as residence spaces, and those barracks were turned into temporary classrooms. During the fire, much of the expensive scientific lab equipment and some of the important records were saved because of the efforts of students who lined up to pass objects from one person to another until they were at a safe distance from the blaze. Donations of furniture, equipment, business machines, and books were received from other colleges, businesses, and individuals, and that allowed the school to reopen for classes the following Tuesday. Today at Ferris, the art of collaboration hasn't changed that much, especially when the students, faculty, and staff get together, such as Ferris State University's Interprofessional Wellness Clinic. This half-day-a-week clinic run by students and faculty from the nursing, pharmacy, and optometry programs provides disease-specific eye examinations, one-on-one -on -one education, and counseling for medication, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, asthma, emphysema, and glucose cholesterol profile monitoring. This is a present-day example of the collaboration that happens at Ferris State University. My plea in Michigan, and it be my plea until the last breath I draw and the last word I speak, is education for all children, all men, and all women of Michigan all the people, in all our states, all the time. Woodbridge Ferris was a believer in education for everyone. The qualities he looked for in students was a craving to learn and the ability to work hard. One such Ferris student was Gideon Smith. He was a member of the 1910 Ferris football team, and upon graduating, he became the first African-American football player at Michigan State University. Gideon Smith came to Ferris Institute as one of several students who were looking for educational opportunities that were not offered to them in the South. Here are some recollections of a Ferris graduate. Percival Prattis, who went on to become the editor of both the Chicago Defender and Pittsburgh Courier newspapers. What did I want to do anyhow? This was 1915, and I was 20 years old. In the circles that included my friends, the talk was always about growing up to be a lawyer. I wanted to go to Harvard to study law, but you couldn't work on the farm at Harvard. Also, you had to have some money, and you had to have sufficient credits or units in various subjects. Harness making and bricklaying, which I had learned something about at Hampton, wouldn't help me at Harvard. I had heard of a school in northern Michigan where some of our boys had gone to study subjects that will enable them to pass college entrance examinations. I decided I would try to go to that school, Ferris Institute in Big Rapids, Michigan. Ferris Institute was inspiring. With its large, capacious buildings, it didn't look as new as it really was. It had been founded in 1884 by Mr. and Mrs. Woodbridge in Ferris as an industrial school. By the time I reached Ferris, it was no longer an industrial school. It was what I have always called it, a cram school. Classes began at 6 o'clock in the morning and continued until 6 in the evening, the only breaks being for a chapel service at 8 o'clock in the morning and for lunch. I was at Ferris from September 1916 
until June 1917. During that period, practically 10 months, I covered the following courses, two years of French, two years of Latin, algebra, plain geometry, trigonometry, rhetoric, and spelling. Today, Ferris State University embraces diversity in many ways. This can be seen in areas such as the Center for Latino Studies and the Veterans Resource Center, as well as the Offices of Diversity and Inclusion, Multicultural Student Services, International Education, and Educational Counseling and Disability Services. An example of the celebration of diversity is shown through the International Festival of Cultures. For over 25 years, the International Festival has been a showcase of cultural diversity through education, food, entertainment, activities, and exhibits. Today, being diverse is who we are. As students, faculty, and staff at Ferris State University, we have grown from the philosophy of Woodbridge Ferris. Correlate all the work of your school to the work of the community in which you live. Woodbridge Ferris was an active member of the Big Rapids community. In 1896, he wrote a column in the Pioneer newspaper noting that the institution's presence provided support for 60 families within the city who opened their homes as boarding houses, as well as over 1,100 students who became temporary residents and used goods and services throughout the Big Rapids community. Donald Rankin, the first combined dean of students, epitomized the ethical community spirit of Ferris employees as the mayor of Big Rapids from 1952 to 1956. He started his tenure on campus as both a commerce instructor and then dean of men, and in the following year became the dean of student life. He grew the position from a staff of two, dean of men and dean of women, to an organization of over 100 employees. Rankin built up a system of student services designed for the spiritual, emotional, and physical well-being of all students on campus. He started the Student Health and Counseling Center with the assistance of a local physician. He also started student recreation teams and developed student government, the Interfraternity Council, the Panhellenic Council, and the Residence Hall Association. He also worked with creating financial aid for veterans and forming the Department of Public Safety. Most of what students see today under student affairs has its root in Don Rankin's dedication to the institution. Jump ahead more than 50 years and you can see the influence that Don Rankin has had on the community at Ferris. The big event that Ferris puts on every year has been a give back to the community experience sponsored by student government beginning in 2008. The students volunteer to complete yard work and house repair projects to hundreds of local community residents. From Woodbridge Ferris in the late 19th century, to Don Rankin in the 20th century, and to you, the future in the 21st century, you can be part of an ethical community that will reshape what Ferris State has to offer. We need more self-reliance and self-sacrifice. Standing on the campus quad is a statue of Woodbridge Ferris. On it, he is identified as a statesman, humanitarian, and educator. However, what many students may not know is that, as far as his political career was concerned, he lost far more races than he ever won. In fact, it wasn't until the 1912 Michigan gubernatorial race that he was successful. He was then re-elected to governor, but lost in an attempt for a third term. After that, he was elected in 1922 as one of Michigan's United States Senators. Since its founding in 1884, Ferris has been dedicated to meeting standards of excellence. In 1958, Ferris was first accredited as an institution, largely through the hard work of its then-president, Victor Spothelf. Jump ahead to the fall of 1975, and in a small room in the Science Building, the Michigan College of Optometry was started. Today, it is the premier optometry school in the state. In addition to the Michigan College of Optometry, the welding program at Ferris State University is another recognized area of excellence and is a point of pride. These are just two examples of the many great programs here at Ferris.
Education is life. It involves growth, development, and training. When it came to learning, Woodbridge Ferris was always finding ways to enhance his learning prowess. He did not believe that learning was simply reading information from a book, but rather the ability to be skilled in the application of those concepts that you have learned. One program that exemplified this learning structure was the Aviation Program. This program was in existence from 1939 to 1943 and was hosted by Ferris and run in conjunction with the Civil Aeronautics Administration using Robin Hood Airport just north of town. With the end of World War II, there was no longer a need for this program and it was eventually discontinued. In 1893, the College of Pharmacy was founded, and in 1938, the College of Pharmacy became the first accredited program at Ferris. It became a doctorate-level program in 1990. What Woodbridge Ferris believed about learning, by doing, still holds true today. Even with all of the technology available, whether it's a computer, tablet, or smartphone, you have to be able to apply the skills related to what you have learned to achieve your goals. I have always entertained the notion that the majority of mankind sleeps 24 hours a day, awaken students to a realization of what it means to live, and they will have little difficulty in performance. Woodbridge Ferris was dedicated to giving people an opportunity to succeed. After he was elected governor of Michigan, he felt that the education he worked for gave him the opportunity to do great things. As the governor of Michigan, Mr. Ferris was instrumental in the negotiations to settle the Michigan-Ohio border dispute with then-governor of Ohio, Frank Willis. Another noteworthy event happened in July of 1893 when the Ferris Loan Fund Association voted to approve the purchase of a secretary's book and to deposit their funds into the Macosta County Savings Bank. Sixty-five years before any federal loans would become available to students, the Ferris faculty recognized that not all students could afford to attend Ferris Institute. They were willing to offer loans to students up to the amount of $50. At that time, a full 12 weeks course tuition cost $18. The funds for the loan were collected out of faculty salaries and repayments of previous loans. Student default on the loans was low, and in an 1898 report, it noted that of 45 loans which had come due, only three had defaulted. This aided students who even if they had won a scholarship to Ferris Institute, to be able to pay for room and board. Woodbridge Ferris thought this was an opportunity that everyone deserved. Today, Ferris continues the tradition of opportunity by offering students hundreds of scholarships totaling over $1 million. Plus, Ferris is one of the few universities that receives tuition incentive program grants allowing economically disadvantaged students an opportunity for a college education. In addition, the Student Debt Task Force, commissioned by the president, works to keep down the level of debt students amass. Ferris always has and will continue to provide an opportunity for everyone.